Hi, everyone. Hello, I hope you're hearing me. This is Evo Haining. We are coming to you with another one of the Prompt Craft Guidebook Workshops. This is going to be Prompt Craft 2. Specifically, we're going to be looking at all of those elements in our advanced topics course. And hi, my name is Evo. I'm here to join you today. There are going to be a handful of us joining live for this webinar. This is a full length one hour webinar uh, followed by a Q&A. So those of you who are joining us here, you're going to see me jump in. And then at some point, I'm going to invite you to jump in as well. Uh, so you will be able to either uh, watch this live with me now or asynchronously. So uh, those of you who are watching live, welcome. Uh, there is a chat function here. Um, those of you who are watching live can chat with me through the comments and I can put those in the show. So if you are seeing me now live and you want to chat with me, there are different ways to do that. Feel free to send me a comment and your question and we'll do our best to weave those in throughout the time we have together today. So thank you for joining me. This is Evo Haining. I'm going to pull myself out because you don't need to see me to uh, remember that I'm here because I'm going to be talking with you throughout. But hi, everyone. It's good to see you. So we are going to be diving into Prompt Craft 2, and specifically, we're going to be looking at advanced topics today in Prompt Craft. So this is a quick guide to getting started uh, if you have already perhaps tried your hand at some of the image generators or the writing uh, and chat generators, we're going to be melding some of that work with new tools and training mechanisms so that you can get closer to the worlds that you want to create. So this is an advanced topics toward world building course, whether you are looking at 2D world building for print or 3D world building for perhaps XR and immersive work, uh, gaming, all of that. So this is applicable to a pretty wide variety of uh, those of you who are storytellers or those of you who are nonfiction world builders who are creating an experience for someone. I want you to think carefully about those details and how they create ripple effects as every action and everything you're creating has the potential to create an interaction and a decision point, a choice for the people who are going to experience your work later. So I want you to think about the worlds you wanna create and then be very intentional about how you put that into your prompt craft today. So uh, this is the Reality Craft second course on advanced topics in generative media. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to go into a process and explore how that can inform your work. And then we're going to take some questions and do some participatory interactive time together. So this is similar to what I do in my live studio here. I am based in Oakland, Emeryville, uh, California, East Bay. And we do a process of generative creativity where I help you explore what you're trying to achieve and how that creates a culture, how that creates a community or an experience. So these uh, do track back to the sorts of experience design topics. Um, if those of you are into whether it's design topics, UX, all of these other things do come into play quite a bit. So let's dive into what is prompt craft to start. Prompt craft is a process to realize and design your generative creative works. So it is a refinement of language and then some. Obviously, we start with language uh, when we're talking about text to image or text to video that starts with language, but then we are adding other aspects to it. Those images that we might be prompting from, for example, for inspiration and, and uh, and advising a model of the world that we are hoping to achieve. When we add an image or many images, that is then refining the prompt. Same with those numbers. And we're gonna talk about parameters and where numbers fit in, because obviously in prompt craft, some of you have seen, for example, the two colons with a number after it. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about image weights, multi-prompting, and the ways in which you would use uh, parameters specifically to help refine what you're getting, especially out of an image generative tool. So uh, those of you who have taken the first course might remember this piece. A prompt is a series of words, numbers, other characters that can include emoji, for example. Those 
characters express an idea that can be generated. A uh, diffusion model is basically taking noise and then making sense of the noise based on each aspect of the prompt. So every word you're giving it, it is going to try and recreate out of the noise. Now, a prompt can include a wide mix of characters, and it's going to speak to a number of specific things. The content type that you're trying to create, the description, obviously those are those beautiful descriptive scene words that you might be using. Um, and we're going to talk about how to refine that to get it down to the bare minimum of what's useful. Uh, style words, and that can include uh, words of an artistic style or a tone. Composition, which also includes things that might be in photography or cinematography or stage direction. Uh, words that help uh, distinguish a background from a foreground, for example. And then parameters, uh, and those include those image weights, those include things like aspect ratios or other uh, details that you specifically need from your generation. Now, parameters are dealt with very differently in different tools. So we're going to start with looking at uh, Stable Diffusion today and Dream Studio. But I wanted to show you, for example, how this maps to for MidJourney. For example, right? So in Mid Journey, you see the image prompt, you see the descriptor or the text prompt, and you see those parameters at the end. Uh, a formed prompt in Stable Diffusion might look somewhat similar, but might have a different designation for the parameters, for example, or it might have a different way of parsing the uh, interaction and the interface altogether. And we're going to look at Dream Studio because that's a pretty interesting and clean example of that. We're also going to look today at another tool, and I'm going to bring this up very shortly because this is something that I personally use for my own uh, sort of refinement of prompt craft. So um, what the slide I just passed there is around aspect ratios and normalizing of aspect ratios. When you are thinking about creating uh, any type of image work, you need to understand what is the output that you are going toward and then help it find it. And that includes things like aspect ratio, but that also includes things like image quality and maybe what you are starting with in terms of images. So there's a number of ways we can use, for example, multiple images to blend together to create sort of a style transfer as it's called, for example, applying a uh, painterly old world style to a new world subject. This is uh, what happens in multi-prompting with multiple images. And so there are ways to make that work both in, in mid-journey and uh, we're gonna look a little bit at some of the tools at Hugging Face later that also can allow for uh, a more detailed refinement of your images. So uh, this is the, the sort of formation and some of the things I want you to think about. Um, and, and it's really great to see all of your comments and thank you all for uh, dropping in those questions and comments today. We're gonna get to a few of those in just a few minutes. Uh, so really great to see you all here. If you're thinking about how all of these pieces are going to add up to your specific workflow, some of the decisions I want you to be thinking about very early on are what tool is right for the experience you are looking to have. And also I want you to think about um, if there is a specific type of um, interaction that you need your users to have down the road. So you need to be thinking about the final production as you are engineering even the first prompts toward it. And, and that's a sort of thinking backwards of your end goal and your production goals ahead of time. So, um, and I, I want to uh, honor that I have someone in the green room here because we have someone from our workshop who is going to join us for Q&A. And, uh, and Gabby, thank you for joining us. You are in the right place and you're going to stay right where you are for now. If you're watching me and able to see me, you can just give me a thumbs up and I'm going to bring you into the show at the end. So that allows me to, uh, it, here at StreamYard, we have a way to bring people into our show and have those interactions be relatively seamless. So uh, those of you who want to join a future uh, webinar and do a little bit of a Q&A, we're going to do that at the end. 
And not all of that is going to stream because honestly, we like to keep some of that uh, specific to the use case and specific to the people who are creating. So um, if you are looking for that kind of one-on-one -on -one feedback, you can add that to your webinar when you are uh, picking those up at my website too. So I just want to give you that option. Um, when we're talking about which tools to use, the open source workflow for many is vitally important. And that might be because you're in the public sector. That might be because you're not uh, budgeted to use a tool like MidJourney. It might not be appropriate for what you're trying to produce. So I want you to feel like you can choose the right workflows that are right for you. We are going to primarily be exploring in Stable Diffusion. And then we're going to be looking at a tool called Scenario.gg from there. But I wanted to give you this tool to start. And we're going to jump over to this tool very shortly, but I'm going to make sure I have this URL up for you. This is prompterguide.com from Shane. And Shane has built a very cool, uh, it's basically a Google worksheet that will help you keep track of your prompt craft in a single place. And you can donate to him. And I highly encourage you to do that. Uh, we're going to look at this tool right now because it's a uh, very easy to kind of get involved and get used to it. Uh, Shane has created uh, basically a really strong series of tools here. Um, and uh, some folks are, are picking up his shirts, for example. But when you look at Prompter Guide, what you're going to see is a visual notebook. And that is going to help you keep track of things that work for you. Now, uh, you may find that a specific word works very well, for example, in Stable Diffusion as a descriptor, but it doesn't carry over well to other tools. And this is a place where you're going to be able to keep track of that. So um, inside the prompter guide, you're going to be able to basically come in and you'll see this kind of tool. And what it will do is help you organize all of those parameters and then spit out a single prompt that you can then copy and paste over. Now, that's extremely helpful if you are trying to track hundreds of prompts and what's working for you. Um, I, I just want to encourage you to go ahead, uh, pick it up on your own time and donate if it's useful to you. It's not necessary, um, but it is helpful, I find, personally. So, um, as we're talking about different tools and, and how to organize yourself, sometimes making the leap from one tool to the next or refining your workflow to go from your first tool, which might be like Stable Diffusion 2.0, 2.1, something on the web, to building your own training model. You're going to want to keep track of what's working. And then you might need to build an organizational system for yourself, whether that's a server or a cloud service, where you're keeping track of thousands of images and then video content on top. So having an organizational plan for yourself ahead of time, whether that's a folder system on your internet, however you're going to manage yourself. Um, I want you to be thinking now about how these kinds of organizational tools give you language and give you organizational structure along the way. So um, we're going to start, actually, before we go to scenario, I'm going to bring in um, a different screen share. I want to make sure that I take you through one piece of of Dream Studio specifically, and then we're going to talk about some of the other tools that are out there. So we're going to jump around into maybe, oh gosh, it's it's six or seven different tools today, and I realize that that is potentially going to be a lot to track. So if you are finding that along the way, you just get overwhelmed, <laughs> right? We're going to also be looking at some of the places you can go for. Um, just to just to you know sort of recenter yourself in the work uh but we're going to start with dream studio here and i just want to make sure that it's working basically every time i bring up a new generative tool it's going to validate and take some time to make sure that i have uh made sure i am still a human being and so i'm going to log in again and see and make sure that everything is validated and working smoothly here and it looks like we're okay yeah, this screen is now going to share. So um, when organizing your tools, uh, there are a handful of tools I've pointed to in a separate video around which tool is right for you and how to find the right tool. Uh, we, I'm going to point you to that video here separately because that uh, 
will take you to places like Future Tools, uh, which is very useful. Um, all of these things are great, but today what we're going to look at starting out right now is Dream Studio. This is Dream Studio Lite. This is uh, Stable Diffusion's basic tool. Um, if you go to dreamstudio.ai, you're going to see this. And uh, this is relatively similar to Midjourney. It is a um, low-cost, accessible way to test your prompt craft in an open window. So um, we've been working on environments and backdrops, and we we're going to talk a little bit about skyboxes a bit later on. But uh, Crystalline Worlds um, with Labradorite, Matrix, Quartz, Towers. Now, I'm going to talk you through not only what I just wrote in that prompt, which is a descriptive background for a scene, and I need to put an environment word here, environment or backdrop or skybox, right? I need to give it some descriptive words that are going to help it understand what I'm looking for, not just some sort of random abstract thing. So I'm looking for an environment. Maybe I do want to use the word skybox. Um, and then I need to be clear about the parameters I'm looking for, right? So those aspect ratios here in Dream Studio are going to be over here. Let's say I'm going to look for something that is closer to a landscape. So maybe I'm going to go to a 1024 by a 768. Or, there we go. Um, CFG scale here adjusts how much the image will be like your prompt. So if I were using an image to start the process, which I can do right here, I can upload an image that might be uh, something useful, and maybe it isn't useful, or maybe it's going to take this and use it as the color scape of what I'm going to do. So let's say I want it to be relatively close to this image. I want it to maybe take some, some clues from this image. And so I'm going to bring this up. A higher value keeps your image closer to the prompt. Number of steps, I'm going to go ahead and, and drop this up a little bit, but you're going to notice something right here, which is my credits. And uh, many of these tools use a credit system. So if I'm going to maybe want to be conservative on my credits, maybe I don't want to generate four images. Maybe I only want to generate three or two. Um, so then it dropped to half the number of credits needed. So these are the kinds of things you can toggle specifically in a stable diffusion window like Dream Studio. There are more advanced versions of stable diffusion. <clears throat> and I want you to see here, there are the different versions of stable diffusion here. Um, stable diffusion, stable inpainting as well. And we're going to talk just a little bit about inpainting. We don't go into too much detail in this workshop, but I want you to be thinking about inpainting as an option for yourself is you're thinking about how you're going to achieve your specific production goals. Because you may find, for example, what we're gonna generate here based on my image and my prompt together, we're gonna see it's probably gonna take a minute or two for that to work. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, sorry, pull this out because I realize you're not able to see my prompt fully. And uh, thank you, thank you for letting me know that that was on there. My apologies. So, uh, what I've typed here: Crystalline Worlds, Environment Skybox with Labradorite, Matrix, Quartz, Towers. Now, um, what I'm trying to do is give it specific, concrete things to prompt for, um, while also giving it a general idea of the thing I'm looking for, right? So the context in this case is I need an environment. I need a skybox. I need something that I'm going to be able to pull into another program and maybe paint into a skybox, even if it's not in skybox form yet. And we're gonna talk a little bit about skyboxes and environments later. Um, but this is one way that you can at least start your backdrop art process. So um, words like environment or architecture, um, all of the kinds of uh, background words, the kinds of things that you would read in a script that describe the background, the setting, those words are generally very helpful when you're looking at how to get to a generative model. All right, so let's see what it created. It did take very clear clues from that image. Right. So let's see if we can look at one of these up close. So it tried to make sense of that image and create 
from my description something. And you can see it came very close to the composition and the color of the original image. So that's where um, putting that CFG scale up quite a bit made for something that was trying to stay quite true to the original image. Now, maybe this isn't going to help me. Maybe this composition isn't what I was looking for at all. And I can then go back and say, let's go to a different lower CFG scale and try to create something that's a little bit uh, different, that, that isn't necessarily like that image I had before. So this is where experimentation with those parameters um, both in terms of image weights. So CFG scale is doing something similar to those image weights in a multi-prompt that would do. So example would be two colons and a number like the number two. Um, that is an image weight and that is giving a greater emphasis to the actual image versus what I am trying to then generate. So it looks like by using the, the sort of image CFG scale is still set at 12 here. So um, I'm going to need to drop this all the way down, I think, and then experiment again with something that's at like a one. And these are the kinds of things that iterative cycles might help you get closer, but you might also need to find that you need to use a different model altogether. So where I'm using stable diffusion V2.1768 here, I might want to drop back to 2.0, or I might want to try something within painting or a different type of tool altogether. So uh, maybe I like this image more. Maybe it's it's got something different that I'm looking for. I would then go ahead and download it. And then I have that for myself to then go ahead and take to another program. Now, when we're going over to the next program we're going to look at, which is Scenario, I want to maybe build a library of 50 different uh, uh, images that are all built on the same prompt or the same collection. So um, I'm going to show you the prompt that I just used here in a banner because I want you to be able to think about how this prompt was formed. It's really only a few words because what I did here was try to simplify to the very minimum, right? I took out all words that are articles or are um, non-useful descriptors. So words like very, don't you don't need them. So what I kept here, um, and, and the word with could actually be taken out as well and, and could potentially have a comma there. I have separated the sections of the prompt just a little bit. So the, the content type from the description. Um, if I am trying to show multiple uh, different types of things in the same prompt, I might use commas as well. So if I'm trying to render a woman separate from a cat, I might say a woman wearing blue and then comma and then say a black cat. <laughs> and those things needed to be separated in order for the engine to not render them as one thing. So that's where commas and some people also will separate using colons. There is a, uh, a slightly different way that colons are parsed. And so colons are extremely useful for designating the image parameters and the sort of sections of your image. And uh, we're going to talk just a little bit about that shortly. So I'm going to bring back our slides and we're going to be heading over to a tool called scenario because what scenario is going to do for us is let's say you've now built in this you let's say you were over in dream studio you got to 50 images that you've liked that have built you know some sense of the world you want to create right maybe you went through the in painting and as you can see here, it wants the automatic sampler option. All of these things, you can see the seed changes, all of these things. But let's say I went ahead and generated 50 images that I loved. I've got something that looks like the world, even if it's not every detail, it has the right tone and feel of it. And then once I've built my whole collection, I've got you know somewhere between 40 and 100 images that 
have the description of the world I'm looking for. Then I am going to build a training model based on those images and then prompt it again to give me exactly what I want. So basically I'm getting to this stage of refinement. Now, isn't that lovely? It's a completely different vibe. What you see here, and I'm gonna try and, and show you, um, and I'm gonna download this because I think it's really lovely, but completely different in terms of this is using stable in painting 2.0. Now let's say I wanted to be very clearly able to then take this and shift it into a different direction for my composition and then maybe use it again. Uh, all of those are options for you. I just wanted to sort of give you the um, refinement of that tool to start. So I'm going to pull back into our slides and then we're going to go to scenario.gg because I want you to be thinking about what happens after you've built a collection of images that are close but not quite. Um, what you're going to find in world building is that generally you're going to need to bank um, potentially thousands of images. And if you've got characters and a bunch of other things that you're trying to do all at once, it's all going to come together in a way that might take you some time to organize. So uh, when we're talking about training a model, and I'm going to step back, we're, this is a scenario.gg, and I'm going to make sure that uh, all of us have that URL here. And it's http.scenario.gg. Um, you can see that this is a tool that is used for, let's say, the game developer who is trying to refine their characters, and that might include their own art as well as generative art and blending them together. So this is the place where you would come. Um, there are half a dozen tools that do something similar here, um, but we're going to go through and really look at uh, specifically within this tool what we can do with it. And um, thank you for those of you who have questions. I'm going to hold some of them till later, but we will get to a few of them as we go. So uh, this tool specifically, Scenario.gg, is relatively new. Um, it's been out in the last few months. It is being used by a lot of game developers and other world builders for different types of backgrounds and assets. So um, what you're going to see when you come into this tool is that you can create your own generator. And there are different ways to do that. You can do sort of the auto version first time out. It's going to create the training parameters for you. Or you can do what is an advanced training, which is going to let you have more control over uh, a great deal of the detail, including training model information that might be uh, a little too advanced, right? It's we're, That's going into the field of machine learning. If that's not comfortable for you, you don't have to engage that. So I just want to give you those options as you're thinking about this toolkit. So um, you come into scenario, you log in, it says, okay, we're going to create a training set, a generator based on all of your images. Let's say you've banked 100 images of the background that look really close, but not quite there. You're going to go ahead and put those 100 images in here. And then you're going to either tell it that you need to you know, train it toward a specific type of, of content. Let's say we know we're going to be doing worlds, maps, buildings, and environments. So we might designate that. And then it's going to help us really think about matching aspect ratio, quality, all of the outputs to the thing that you are trying to create. So in this case, that content type part of the prompt is being prompted for you. They're asking you, what are you trying to create here? And then once you've said worlds, buildings, I'm trying to create other buildings. I'm not creating a temple or a board game or a 2D map. I'm creating something else. And, and this is where you can get pretty granular about what it is you're trying to build for your specific world. Now, at this point, you are going to be basically uploading 100 images, or it, could, it can be any number. It can be somewhere between 10 and 100. And then what we're going to do here is look at what you can do with that. So this is in my scenario. And I have uh, put a whole bunch of training images in here. I designated the number of training steps and the learning rate. And now I have this generator. So I'm going to say generate images based on my particular set. And here I can tap to type a prompt. So I want a modern 
crystalline home living room maximalist and uh, cobalt blues. Now those kinds of just descriptors, maybe I need something very specific in this room. And so I could say foreground table, background art. And let's see if that helps it. Now there are a couple of other things here um, that I might, there, there's a prompt helper, which is interesting, right? So that might give you some types of things that again, we, we talked about earlier that might want to be in your prompt, right? So I might want to say that the lighting is uh, like a, a dramatic lighting. I really love those sort of, you know, uh, crepuscular ways. I'm going to say that wrong. Cre cre I'm not going to even try and say it. The beautiful rays that come in on sunlight in the morning in your windows, right? So maybe that's the kind of lighting I'm looking for in this scene. And so I can go ahead and use the prompt helper and it's going to add those for me. Um, this is the same sort of thing you would have found in that prompter guide. So you're going to find that these kinds of tools are going to hopefully help you along to building a more uh, detailed environment. The other images. The image specific words I'm gonna put here might include things like 8K or HD um, in terms of looking for a very specific type of quality. Maybe it's a filmic quality or something that looks like a, uh, like a film camera, like an ISO 100 or a word that references a camera like Fujifilm. Those kinds of things are frequently used. Um, if you're trying to do something that looks like a specific style of photography, for example. Now here I have sampling steps again. Um, this you can choose uh, higher or lower. You might get more detailed results the higher you go in steps. So keep that in mind if you're going for something very highly detailed and you're not getting the level of detail you're looking for, you might want to go up in the number of steps. And here I can also use an image as a starter if that's what I want to do. Now, I don't necessarily want to do that in this case because I am going to be prompting on the training set that I created. So I used um, over 50, under 100 of my environments that look like a sort of crystalline home environment, whether it's the exterior or the interior of that home. Um, that was how I chose to train this particular model. Previously, I had done this with those crystalline cats you saw, right? So um, those of you who have been to any of the workshops that we've done before got to see these crystalline cats here. And uh, these cats were also built in scenario, basically under the character generator instead of the background generator. And so what I did to create each of those cat images was to train a model on the cats. Um, and then to go ahead and prompt for the type of cat I was looking for, and then to build a second collection and then animate it. So if you're thinking about a workflow, these cats were originally designed in mid-journey and then trained in scenario to create their own training model, their own generator. And then from there, I was able to prompt for exactly what I wanted. And those cats, to me, looked closer to the characters I was looking for for that particular set, right? So this character, for example, has the, the sort of life likeness, but also is clearly a gem. And, and that sense of hybrid nature was harder to get to in the original tool, both in Midjourney and in Stable Diffusion. So that's where refining through time uh, can really help you get to something that's going to look closer to maybe what you're looking for. So um, I want to encourage you to be in these sort of iterative cycles. Let's see what we got. Okay, so it went pretty close to the training model on some of these because I recognize that this picture, for example, looks really close to one of those images I had given the training model briar, but the reflections are better. This is actually a, a much more beautiful version of this image versus what I had given it uh, to train on. So it's trying to pull out better lighting, more detail. Uh, this is not an image I gave it in the training. So it's, it's making that based on all of those images that I was looking for. But it also went through and tried to match 
based on my prompt closest to the things that were already in the training model. So I, I want to step back and start to take some questions at this point. Um, scenario is one of those things that takes some time to get your head around, but it is extremely useful when you're thinking about how to get started in this space. So um, I, I really like these images. I, I think I do want to keep this one in my, in my hands and I might, you know, use that to build a training model for the whole home at the end, right? So again, when you're generating, you may find that you need to do a heavy editorial and curation process to say, okay, which one of these three scenes actually looks like what I want? Uh, maybe this is the one that's closest. And then you can build a board that is specific to your setting and to your world. Now, can you build all of these into a skybox? Um, there are tools that are just starting to be able to do that level of uh, basically outpainting. Um, we're going to talk just a little bit about what is in painting and outpainting along with those skyboxes. So um, I wanted you to at least get a sense of how the components are created first um, in terms of being able to build uh, something closer to your concept. And this is all about concept refinement at this point. Uh, once you've gotten to this stage where you've got, okay, maybe the, the hundred shots of your world that look exactly the way you want them, you might still need to paint them together to get to something like a skybox. So uh, some of you have been a part of the Reality Craft group, and I just want to thank those of you who have been uh, active there. Um, if you're not in that group yet, you are totally welcome to join us. Reality Craft is on uh, Facebook and also on LinkedIn. So you can jump into those groups. Uh, they are accessible, and I try to update weekly with videos and new tools. Uh, the video, I'm not going to go ahead and show you right now, but that is on my uh, YouTube channel if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, based on the work that Blockade Labs has been doing around skyboxes, we've been doing some experiments together in this space on blockadelabs.com. Um, and, and specifically, they have a URL I'm going to go ahead and put up for us. It's, um, I, I apologize that I don't have one built for them yet, but it is skyboxes, uh, skybox.blockadelabs.com. And let me go ahead and just put that up for you here. So if you are trying to create these kinds of skyboxes for the first time and thinking about how this is going to come together for, let's say, the background to a 360 or a VR, XR type experience, um, skybox.blockadelabs.com is where you can go to do that. Um, some of us have been testing those <laughs> and trying to figure out exactly what we can get there. And uh, this is a very new tool. And it is uh, getting hit a lot by a lot of people testing it all at once. So you may find that you are not able to get to a clearly generative process quickly. Um, I want to show you what's in the prompt craft specifically in this scene. It is slightly different than what we just looked at uh, because this Blockade Labs doesn't have the benefit of the training that I gave to Scenario in terms of all of my previous images and work. So when I'm going to Blockade Labs, it hasn't learned my style. It doesn't know anything about the world I'm creating. And I have to basically start from scratch again. Now, you can feed it an image. However, I have not found that image generation in Blockade Labs is working super cleanly yet. I suspect that's coming um, but these are very early stage tools. So if you're thinking about the, you know, the skyboxes, the backdrops, the backgrounds, and trying to create those 360 environments, uh, this is specifically to that. Now, one thing we were talking about, and I recognize, uh, I think we've got, um, yeah, the, the type of prompt craft that works in a handful of these web-based uh, tools. Many of them are using a version of Stable Diffusion on the back end. And while you'll find that Midjourney can take tons of characters and uh, can take, for example, like 50 words, you can use a very long prompt in Midjourney. With a, with a tool like Blockade Labs or even some of the uh, other generators we've seen, like um, 
like simulacra. Uh, these these are much more like they're like light versions. They're like a little bit like the dream studio light we just saw. They are uh, preferring to read maybe seven to ten words max. They don't want to read a long story. So you can't just take a big old chunk of text from chat GPT, put it in blockade labs and expect it to work. It's not going to. Uh, it's only going to read maybe the first 10 words that you put in. And so I thought, uh, and and thank you, uh, Gabby, I appreciate your feedback on that Skybax test, um, 200 characters being a, a healthy limit to, to kind of refine your own prompt craft. Think about how the uh, the algorithms here are reading your prompt and they're giving the most weight to the words at the front. So the words at the very top need to be the things that need to be most important in your scene. And that might be in the foreground. So when we're thinking in 2D, we're often prompting from the foreground to the background. You're going to paint a scene. You're basically describing the scene for your generator and you want it to be able to read that and so the first words that you put in are the things it's going to value and give the most emphasis toward same way as an image weight would but in this case like the first seven words matter most so that's where you want your essential objects or nouns if there is one verb that you're going to use then this would be the place to do it and uh in this case, I, I have not used a single verb because I don't want it to be showing me an action. I want it to be showing me a, a scene, a backdrop. But in a in a different tool, let's say if I'm in in this tool, even in in uh, in, in a scenario, for example, I might want to go ahead and prompt to actions. And so these are the kinds of choices you might want to be thinking about in your language when you are. Um, let's go ahead and leave those and go back behind. I want to show you a little bit of what this might look like if you're thinking about prompting to action as well as to a background. So here you can see I made some crystal cats in a previous workshop. Um, I didn't give them a lot of actions, but I did train a model based on those crystal and cats. And here I can see the images that I used to train them. You can see that there's a pretty wide mix of things there. Um, most of those came from the journey, but not all. I did not give it a lot of training detail or parameter here. I just kind of went with the basics. But if I go in here and I try to prompt, again, I'm going to try and put the most important things in the first few words. So let's say, what is the key action? I'm trying to show a kitten playing with a string and, and maybe playing is too vague um maybe it's uh clawing kitten clawing string ball living room background dark night so let's see and i'm just i'm just going to do two images for now Let's see if it can get that with some sort of detail. Um, so the choices I made there, I put the action and the noun at the top, right? Those are the objects that I definitely want in this image. Um, I can't leave them to the end of the prompt. They won't make it in, right? I need it to be toward the front. And then the words that I'm going to use near the back of the prompt are going to help it determine, for example, the lighting type or um, certain things about that background that I might want it to clarify over time. So one of these looks like a living room. One of them doesn't. But it did get that it is a living room background. It didn't necessarily get the sort of dark night vibe. And, and also, you know, these cats have some issues, right? There's um some paw cleanup that would need to happen here for this cat, for example. So I just wanted to give you a sense. Um, did these cats show clawing string? No, not really. It didn't really know how to do that action. And that is where you may find that a training tool like Scenario is not the right place to do something. You might need to capture that action first back in stable diffusion and then build your training model for that character 
Um, if, if it doesn't have any reference of a cat playing or clawing anything, it doesn't know what that is. So this is not exactly the place where you would go to start a process. This is where you go to refine a process. And I hope that's clear and why you would use those things differently, um, because you're basically going to be able to train a very specific generator on each character you have in your story. Let's say you've built a story world and you've got three characters. You create a generator for each character and then you need to basically train it to do the 20 things that that character would do, right? The Here's the welcoming dance. Here's the thing I do when I'm agitated. And so you would build your character step by step doing that. And uh, someone asked earlier about seeds and seeds are really important when you are building characters. Those are the kinds of things that help you keep track of a composition you like as well. Um, so if you're working with uh, those seed numbers in both Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey, they are referencing uh, basically a specific uh, composition that it can go back to in its own training model. So if you imagine that it has millions of compositions that it can then go and cross-reference and come back to, um, that's giving it a very specific place to come back to. It's like giving it a little file marker to say, this is the number of that composition I liked. So uh, when you might want to use seeds or when you're getting close to a character that you really want to refine and uh, you might want to keep refining using the same seed or uh, very similar, you know, generations built on the same seed before you take it to a training model. So um, scenario is not the only way to train. There are other tools and we're going to step back and look at some of those other ones. Um, obviously the things that you might get out of blockade aren't necessarily going to work in a place like scenario because scenario wants square images and a skybox or a backdrop by nature is not a square image. It is trying to create the 360 experience. So uh, we're going to go to a different tool, and a, this is more of a community of tools, um, but it's going to help you specifically in thinking about, and I need to make sure that I've got all of the right windows up here. Sorry, one second. Um, this, is the, this is the challenge when we're, when we're talking about uh, so many tools in one place. There are... Uh, we're talking about dozens of them here. So um, Hugging Face uh, is a community of tool builders that includes those who are making new types of, let's say, hybrid uh, tools based on different training sets and algorithms. So um, let's see, I think we're going to start... So this is, this is Runway. Um, Runway has other tools that we are also going to look at. Um, Runway will give you access to some of these same tools as well, but we're going to start with Hugging Face as Hugging Face is a generally open and easy to access community. Um, much of what you're going to see here is open source, and um, there are a number of things that you can access within Hugging Face. So um, Hugging Face is much more sort of tech friendly and accessible to those of you who are feeling ready to perhaps go deeper into training your own models or trying to solve a specific problem that you might be having with your generative process. So um, as you can see here, it's got 139,000 models that are referenced in here, right? So people have built different types of data sets and models uh, based on their own research. So some of these might be appropriate to science or biomimicry or doing something in health or environmental work. Um, obviously, you know, tools like Midjourney have their own uh, models that they're accessing, but these are all different tools that you might choose to access in your own research. Uh, you can put these on your own machines, run your own servers. So that is where we move from prompt craft into something that is more commonly known as prompt engineering. And these are, you know, 
tools that would require a little bit of software experience, perhaps some, some uh, computer background. So if you're an engineer and feeling like you want to dive into these things, uh, all of that is available to you. But I also just wanted to show you the kinds of machine learning apps that the community here is building, because you're going to find things like GPT, Wolfram Alpha, and Whisper, right? So people are adding a wide mix of hybrids here. And that includes things that are uh, using new open source tools. You may have heard of things like ControlNet, for example. Uh, that's going to give you a much deeper level of control in, in every aspect of your in-painting process, let's say. Uh, we, we haven't talked too much about in-painting yet. And in-painting is specifically a process where you might be adding something to your generative work and asking it to paint in that specific area. And in painting, we use, and I apologize, I've got the wrong window up, and I apologize, we've been, uh, that is my bad, and I realize we are not giving you the right window. So let's take you through very quickly the spaces at Hugging Face. Um, Hugging Face does a mix of the computer learning models and data sets, the machine learning spaces, and again, these are relatively technical, but can get you to solve a problem that you may be struggling with. So you may find that your team or your community is having a real problem with something in specific. Uh, in painting and out painting are tools, for example, that developed in these communities for solving specific problems. Let's say I need to paint in a different temple into my backdrop, you may find a tool here that works from you for your particular open source needs versus the type of things that might be uh, behind a firewall or not necessarily appropriate for your community. Um, when you're looking at the solutions here, you can build your own private hubs and you can do some auto train similar to what we just did in Scenario where you're training your own models without code. So if you're thinking about, again, when you're world building, you are generally going to need to train models specific to your characters potentially to objects in your world, gems and things like that can be done in, in scenario and other tools as well. Um, you've got a number of different classes of assets and you might need to train each of them separately. So I want you to be thinking about where you do that training and maybe creating a separate training module for each piece of your world. So um, I'm going to just show you a little bit of how these kinds of things work when you're talking about how do you make it work for your specific computing needs. Many of these programs are working on sort of credit systems and will give you some time, right? They'll let you do some things together for free in the open as part of a community. Um, but then when you get into like auto training and doing, you know, more advanced world building, you might need to be like in a paid program, whether that's with Hugging Face or something else. I believe Hugging Face just did a deal with Amazon. So you're going to start to see these kinds of tools integrated into existing workflows that maybe didn't, didn't happen a couple of months ago. So um, Hugging Face is relatively technical. It's not necessarily for everyone, but it will help you see where those hybrids are existing. For example, between uh, a chat tool like ChatGPT and a image generation tool like Stable Diffusion. So if you're thinking about how you're gonna combine those two or, it, or, or any tools in different ways, you might wanna start at a place like Hugging Face and look at, what people have already built in terms of hybrid models um, and are they useful for you? Does it solve your problem or do you need to kind of start from scratch? So I apologize that uh, we had that little gap on the, the tabs and I wanted to um, step back and, and just give you a little bit of context. Runway.ml uh, and Hugging Face are both places that you can go to find these tools um, in a relatively open way. Uh, Hugging Face is a 
almost open source community. A lot of the tools there are completely open source, not all. If you are trying to find only open source tools, there's a video specific to that that will point you to futuretools.io. Um, and there's a handful of websites where you can specifically look for only the tools that are open source or free. So I want to encourage you to go to, to those sites and go through the directories. There are all there are almost a thousand tools out there now, and it is very difficult to keep track of which ones are useful for each different use case. So if you're struggling with maybe the tool isn't right for your job, go to one of those sites. There's a couple of them in, in the video that's uh, the directories video. I, I will do my best to point to you here. So um, I want you to think clearly about the language that you use in all of your prompt craft. We talked a little bit about choosing a one good verb. Uh, when you're using a, uh, a, a chat bot, like a chat GPT or something like Jasper, Copy AI, Hey Friday, any of it, like even Canva's Magic Write, um, you're going to need to give it one clear verb and it needs to understand what that verb means. So you have to understand that image generators can take action verbs because it understands that running is a is an action. It knows what to do with that. Uh, a chat generator doesn't know necessarily what to do with the word running, but it understands describe, list, enumerate, explain. Uh, it, it has different verbs that it wants. And so learning the, the sort of commands that your specific tool is going to work with might take a little bit of refinement. Now, if you are in a tool and you are trying to get to its specific language set, like some folks have been doing with uh, ChatGPT, trying to understand its underlying language, you can ask it, like, what types of commands will help me do blank? And it will tell you. Uh, with a ChatGPT tool in specific, it can help guide you to the language. Um, image generators are not that good at that. So you need to know where to go to find useful language. I would absolutely recommend starting with something like Prompter Guide because what that's going to do is give you language for art styles or types of lighting, types of cinematography that maybe you didn't have language for prior. Um, but also you can go in through tools like we saw in Scenario that are going to help you find those words. It's gonna be a little prompt helper there for you. So as you're thinking about it, you do wanna keep it simple, drop the articles, focus on your nouns, Focus on the one big idea you're trying to show um, and make that vibrant. Now, juxtapositions work well here. Uh, things that might surprise people work well here. And if you're in a place like uh, Blockade Labs or even in Midjourney or Stable Diffusion, using a word like surreal or surrealism, those words can create surprise. And sometimes you might want to mix it up and, and give yourself some surprise before you get to the like final refinement and production stage. So I want to give you some, some sort of freedom to be inquisitive and to experiment, right? Ask for what you need, but keep remixing, and keep iterating until you get close. And then when you have a hundred images that are close, build the training model and refine it so you get exactly what you need for your production. So uh, quick generative tips, you're going to experiment with many different generative tools along the way. Um, obviously, some of you are looking for specific open source tools. So start with like stability.ai. That's where stable diffusion is. Uh, you can go into, uh, for example, what we saw with Hugging Face. And you can go to places like Future Tools and search specifically for open source tools. There are video open source tools that are coming out. And uh, my next few videos will go over some of the more uh, product you know, paid kind of solutions for making generative video. Uh, all of those things are coming, including generative 3D content, uh, generative 3D worlds. All of those pieces are coming. The tools are in alpha. 
if not in beta. So if you are trying to figure out how to solve a problem and the tools just don't seem to be there yet, just wait a few months, they'll be there. Um, but get started in, in some of the open source tools that you're going to find. Uh, use your generative media tools to create a starting point. So you're going to create a palette. You're going to create the look and feel, the tone. And this is where it really helps to iterate and then curate. So you're going to make maybe 300 generated images, call it down to the 30 you like, and then make your training model based on the 30 that actually work for you. So at that point, remixing, and um, whether you're using a secondary tool like a scenario, or you're just taking that one image into a completely different model to see what happens. Remixing and then adding new words can sometimes help new things come out of the image. Uh, same with blending multiple images and multi-prompting. So you can take an image from Stable Diffusion and an image from Midjourney, bring them together and get a different style than either of those tools would naturally create. Now, is that useful to your type of world building? That needs to be discovered by you. Um, there are sort of infinite styles that can be created. Uh, much of what we've seen has been sort of copycat styles because of the way memes work and the way people kind of copy other people's prompts. So I'm gonna encourage you to create your own language create the language that works for your world, right? The descriptive language, the scenic descriptions, all of the context, and then keep track of every word that is useful for you. Test it in a couple of different tools, like the word crystalline, for example. I use crystalline and prismatic throughout because I wanna see how each tool is translating those words when I'm creating something new. So Blockade Labs making a skybox is going to interpret crystalline different than something like Midjourney might because they're using different data. They've got different algorithms under the hood. So this is where experimentation matters. So use the tools, experiment effectively. Try something like playground.ai. Um, this is where, again, when we're talking about in painting and out painting, these are useful tools for you. And then uh, lexica.art, if you're looking for more words to refine your prompt craft, let's say you want a specific look and feel that looks like something you've seen, but you don't know what the prompts are, lexica.art is where you might go to find those. Uh, there's a handful of other places as well where you can go and just look at the prompts people are using to get those results. If you're trying to figure out how are they getting such realistic results, they might be using something like Automatic 1111, which is a version of Stable Diffusion. Uh, they might be using Laura with ControlNet, uh, which are available, for example, you can uh, go explore in Hugging Face, uh, something called ControlNet. I am just starting to explore this, but uh, these are newer tools where you can get to a great deal of refinement. You can help your tool find the images edges ahead of time and then really work with that much more as a painting module. And so I want you to think about giving yourself a sense of unpredictability and expansiveness along the way and really, you know, surprise yourself. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit and, and thank you for your questions. Um, uh, specifically, automatic 1111 is used for creating photorealism. And uh, I can try and bring that up for you very quickly. But uh, when you're thinking about how do you get to a more, um, let's say you need characters that look almost like they're out of a, out of a magazine. If you're trying to get to um, a very specific type of design quality. Uh, so let's see if I can bring this in for us really quick. Automatic 1111 is a version of Stable Diffusion. It's on GitHub. So this is, if you're installing these on your own server at home, this is potentially going to work for you as a way to render a much more realistic human in your character design. So uh, there are a couple of other methods you might want to try. L-O-R-A is one, um, but automatic 1111. You're going to find specific videos on YouTube are a really great way to pick this tool up relatively quickly if you're an artist. Um, 
these tools are not necessarily for the beginner. And I want to be prefacing everything we talk about here to say uh, this is going to be useful if you are going to run a version of Stable Diffusion at home, especially because uh, you might need to, again, create thousands of images, create your own training models and really upscale and work with those images. You might do some in painting and really, you know, refine what you're getting in terms of every little piece of the experience. So I realized we didn't describe the difference between in painting and out painting very well here today. And I want to step back and make sure I define those words for you. And we're going to add a few questions and then uh, I'm going to cut the stream and do a little Q&A as well. So the word in painting, when we're talking about in painting, let's say I've got my screen here and I want this dark area to be replaced with something else. I might choose this area and then sort of gray it out and then tell my tool that I want to prompt in that space a cathedral or something else. Like I, I want something else in my image. In painting is generating and painting inside the, the confines of the existing image. Whereas out painting is basically adding to the edges of the image. So an out painting tool will take your generative, let's say a landscape image, and then you can keep painting it until it's a panoramic right? You can take the scene sort of all the way around generatively using outpainting. And so we see people using outpainting for creating landscapes that are generative. So um, it is it is like masking uh, with adding the generative piece. And in painting does it to the inside of the image. Out painting is basically telling the generator to keep painting at the edges. So to keep, keep generating from where the edge of your piece is, if that makes sense. Um, I am, I, I'm gonna have to drop to a couple of images specific to in painting and out painting, but I'm gonna refer you to, let's say, in this picture, for example, if I wanted to paint the rest of the stained glass window, I would want to use an outpainting method. And then I would give it this area and say, OK, continue the window. You know, um, different tools do outpainting differently. And I'm going to encourage you. Uh, we're not going to we're not going to go into this too much right now, but certainly within Hugging Face. I'm going to show you just a little bit. Okay. See, I've gotten. So it looks like we have one community related to this particular outpainting tool. Um, but there's no model card here. There's nothing here. So um, whether uh, you everyone has a different method for doing these kinds of things. I have not personally done a lot of out painting yet. Most of what I've been dealing with has not been related to this process. So I don't want to misguide you and tell you to try and, and create it in one tool or the other. Um, within Dolly, for example, their out painting is sort of built in. Um, so you can go in, for example, and this, this is going to show you the, the Dolly experience. We didn't go through Dolly today, but Dolly is certainly um, relatively open source in the sense that it's not uh, a fully open product, but you can engage with it in a, um, you, you, you can, you can bring it into your toolkit and into your workflows. I, I don't want to mislead you and say that it's a fully open source product because it's not. However, what you can do and, uh, uh, these are examples of original out paintings where the generative image started in one direction and then they took it in a different style over time. So um, I am not someone who has used Dolly for out painting yet. I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and try that on your own time. But if you can imagine starting with your square image and then asking it to basically extend the image on both sides, that is the method of outpainting. 
So uh, again, if you're if you're trying to create large scale scenics, this might be the method you need to take on. Um, I have not been doing that for my own work yet, um, but I suspect that I'm going to be doing it in the coming months. So I just wanted to talk you through that process. And uh, yeah, I, I think some of us have been, you know, exploring using our Adobe tools for this. Um, Mage Space, that's a really interesting one. And thank you for those comments. Um, we're going to be cutting this stream very shortly, but I just wanted to encourage you to keep sending in your questions and your thoughts as you're trying to get to tools that might be more useful for you. Go to the YouTube, you're going to find videos. Uh, this, this team uh, that's been building PlayRT has also been building a great new video tool, and that video is going to drop later on today for uh, Augie and AugX Labs. If you go to the website, you're also going to find the experiments we were doing, for example, in Simulacra last week, and this is in 3D uh, prototyping and, and world building in a 3D environment. So I'm going to go ahead and cut this stream, but I just wanted to thank you all for uh, joining me for this portion of this workshop. And if these topics are interesting to you, feel free to go ahead and jump in, uh, grab the book, send your questions over to the community at Reality Craft. I would love to hear what's working for you and also what you're wanting to explore next. Uh, Right now we're dropping three or four videos a week right now on YouTube. So if you are seeing something that you want covered in a future video, please reach out and I will do my best to uh, get a demo or interview with that team so that you get a sense of what that tool can be used for and how it might work for you. I am doing a lot of training sessions now privately. So these workshops are going to be happening less frequently publicly, but I just wanted to thank you for joining me here. I'm going to come on really quick and say thank you for being a part of today's workshop as well. So if any of this is really interesting to you and you want to explore how to bring this into your own organization, please reach out to me and just let me know. Uh, you can always reach out to me on my website. That is evo.ist. And you can please feel free to jump into the Reality Craft groups for more information. I will happily do my best to do all I can to guide you in those directions. So uh, definitely check out the next video that's coming up uh, later today. That is on Meet Augie. And I hope that you will please reach out if you're trying to create some of these wild, surreal environments and you're getting stuck along the way. Uh, let's do a session together and see what we can do. I'm going to go ahead and stop the stream. Thanks for joining me today and have a wonderful day.